I have the unenviable uh, job not only of following uh, two good speakers, but of being the last speaker in the hour after you've had lunch. And so as you slowly slip into a coma, let me say that as I tell my students when I want their attention, this will be on the test. <laughs> I'm actually not going to tell you anything that I could possibly test you on because I have gone into an area in which I know only a superficial amount, but I know more than most people. Because these are areas, the social impact and the economic impact, the political economy impact of the war in Alabama, of the war, of World War I in Alabama, is something that is not studied much at all. If you are looking like most, like most historians, and I'm sure I'll be on my deathbed thinking, what is that next project I want to be doing? Um, if you're like most historians, you're always looking for that next project. This is a project, the discussion of the political economy of Alabama, brought on by this embarrassment of riches of a sudden surge of money coming into the state. And what happens is not only available to us as researchers at the state level, but also at the local level. Uh, so you can do this kind of research with your own local newspapers and your own local uh, materials. Or if you are a teacher, you can sick your students on this stuff, too. Um, my concern is not over there, but it's over here. And again, I'll ask but not answer the questions, how did Alabama's economy, political and social, um, react to World War I? And what happens when a poor state suddenly becomes confronted with prosperity? What happens when you're thirsty, dying of thirst, and suddenly somebody puts a not just a water fountain, but a fire hose in front of your face. There's a lot of water there, none of which you're going to successfully uh, get down your gullet. Alabama's first contribution uh, to the war effort and its first economic returns came in 1917 with the return of these Alabama Guard units from Mexico. They were federalized in April of 1917, sent for a few weeks to guard infrastructure, as uh, Ruth Trust discussed, mustered into the regular army as the 167th Regiment, uh, trained at Camp Mills, uh, New York, under Colonel Screws. That means they weren't here in September, when all those venereal cases were... Uh, <laughs> That wasn't the Alabama boys. If that had been the Alabama boys, there would have been more of those cases because we're better than the Yankees. <laughs> of course, I kid. Uh, other Alabamians went to the 37th, uh, I'm sorry, the 31st Division, the Dixie Division, uh, spent much of the war at Camp Wheeler. Um, and, and all in all, 95,000 Alabamians served, 6,262 died, according to Ruth Trust. Now let me ask you this, what happens to a state that loses 95,000 of its prime aged workers within a 19 month period? Loses them to the economy. Also what happens when these same men get into a cash economy and send that money home? These are questions that no one has asked that I've been able to find. I mean, they may have asked them, but they haven't answered them uh, yet. In addition to the military mobilization, and there's much more to mobilization than just the military. Oh, and by the way, this is the, um, uh, the mobile uh, parade. I got tired of using the, uh, the one that everybody else uses and that I used on the front, so I stole somebody else's picture. Um, the, 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 Alabama hosted units from out of state who trained at camps secured by Representatives Dent and Representative Blackman. The most important of these training camps was here in Montgomery, Camp Sheridan. Note that name. Built at Vandiver Park on the Lower Wetumpka Road, this former site of the Alabama Fair and the assembly camp for, you can see it up there, and the assembly camp for the 4th Alabama National Guard, which later became the 167th, located just outside of town. Congressman Stanley Dent of Ozark was responsible for securing Sheridan for Montgomery and for freezing out Mobile and Birmingham. Uh, and this map 
take, thank you, Google. Uh, this map uh, shows the, uh, uh, the modern location um, just outside on Lower Wetunka Road, just outside of North, North Boulevard. And this was taken in November of uh, two, uh, 2013 by me uh, of the uh, entryway to the camp. Okay. Camp Sheridan was built by Algernon Blair Construction Company using as many local craftsmen and laborers as possible, therefore just pouring money into the local economy. And even, even larger was the boom of 30,000 Ohio troops arriving between June and October 1917 um, with the 37th Infantry Division. The Montgomery population at that time was about 40,000, so this was a significant increase in not only the number of people here, but also think about the amount of money that they brought into the local economy and how they spent it. I mean, my goodness, there were, there were enough prostitutes for a city of 400,000. These guys were paying lots of money into the underground economy that was flowing back into the regular economy, and I noticed nobody laughed. What's the matter with you people? Um, this, this money did pump up the economy, even though these Ohio soldiers were sending money home to their families, just like Alabama soldiers uh, were sending money home to their families. Uh, privates earned between $21 and $40 a week, depend on what, uh, sorry, month, depending on what grade you were. Uh, sergeants made 38 uh, a low of $38 to a high of $105 a month, uh, much of which they spent in town much of which we know where. Um, soldiers' families relocated with them, and Montgomery realtors salivated at the prospect of high rental occupancy rates. Additionally, Montgomery had to improve its infrastructure by contracting with Montgomery Traction and Light to extend a second streetcar track out to the camp. Sheridan also had what's called a remount depot of vet veterinary care because as many trucks as you've seen in these pictures, um, even into World War II, European and American armies were mule-driven and horse-driven, particularly true in World War I. Over the course of two years, this remount depot associated with Camp Sheridan uh, handled 17,300 horses. So you can see by the scale of this 30,000 men, 17,000 mules and horses, we're talking about a, a, a large influx of, of people and infrastructure, um, some of which was handled well, some of which was not handled uh, particularly well. Montgomerians were so excited about the economic possibilities of training these Ohio troops that they put aside their lost cause pride and they got over this camp being named for Phil Sheridan, the Union Cavalry Commander, um, and they welcomed the Northerners. In fact, one WAG R.L. Carey wrote this incredibly long, I'm a, I'm a real fan of doggerel, you know, awful poetry, and um, not the kind that waxes nostalgic, but the kind that you look at and says, this is just bad. <laughs> You know, I like B-grade movies a lot, too, um, because I don't deserve any better. Anyway, um, what this, this R.L. Carey uh, uh, fellow wrote this incredibly long poem that went on and on and on and finally ended with, Hello, Buckeyes, howdy do, darned if we ain't proud of you. Going out to France to fight, armored only with the right. Going where the shrapnel falls, going where the old flag calls, son of men who wore the blue, Alabama welcomes you and, of course, your money. Montgomery also hosted Taylor Field. Uh, that's Montgomery County, actually, uh, which was constructed by the James Alexander Company using local people, and it's out at Pike Road. Uh, this was the only air service station in Alabama. Taylor Field opened in April of 1918 with over 100 airplanes, the so-called Standard J or J-1 mounted with a Hall Scott engine that had the annoying habit of bursting into flames for no apparent reason. <laughs> After two pilots died in one week between May and June because of these engine failures, one of which, poor guy, engine burst in flames, what do you do? You put the plane into a dive, you hope that you can, can get away from the flames, it got too hot, climbs out of the cockpit, holding on to his seat belt, 
And sure enough, the, the flames go out. He can't get back into the cockpit. And as my dad used to say, it ain't the fall that kills you. It's that sudden stop at the end. After these two guys died because of engine failures, the commander replaced the J-1s with what you see here, the J-4 Jennies, which are incredibly forgiving uh, aircraft with, a, with that excellent Curtis engine uh, in it. Taylor Field was uh, paired with the, with the uh, Repair Depot 3, because this is the Army, which was two miles west of downtown Montgomery, the other side of Montgomery from Pike Road, on the, on the Alabama River at the old Wright Brothers Flying School. Now the picture of Governor Henderson over here, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if that actually worked or not, uh, the guy that looks like a happy walrus. Um, <laughs> that's the governor of Alabama, the first airplane ride he had ever taken, uh, and that's a, uh, uh, a pilot from Taylor Field, trained at Taylor Field. Uh, this is, of course, where Maxwell Air Force Base is today. Now, in northeast Alabama, same kind of things happen. At Camp McClellan, you, you notice a kind of a similarity in the names. There's a pattern here in the names. Um, the Army leased 4,000 4, acres of hilly land near Anniston for a machine gun training camp. And at that time, machine gunnery was considered part of the artillery. So they needed hills because, you know, bullets don't know when to stop. Um, this was secured by Congressman Fred Blackman, who also beat out Birmingham. It opened in December 1917 and hosted the 29th Infantry Division, called the Blue and Gray. The 29th departed for France in June of 1918, so they were there from December until June. They were replaced by African American units who were being trained for combat. The, uh, Na I'm sorry, the Maryland National Guard, 1st Separate Negro Company, the Ohio National Guard, 9th Battalion of Infantry Colored. These joined the 93rd Infantry Division under French command and, and did exceptionally well trained in Alabama. Camp McClellan was built by a New Orleans contractor who won the contracts over Alabama uh, developers, but he had difficulty securing workers, just weren't enough workers. Um, he ended up housing those that he imported, most of whom were African American. Most of these ended up being housed on base. They built the mess, uh, uh, the mess hall first, housed the workers in the mess hall, then they built other buildings, spread the workers out, they continued to build, build buildings, and it was uh, a little while before, um, excuse me, a little while before they could ask all of those workers to move uh, into housing off the base. Now with Jim Crow segregation, this became a problem in predominantly, overwhelmingly white Northeast Alabama. McClellan also had a remount depot uh, under uh, uh, Commander Charles uh, Doolin. Uh, he this had a, um, a railroad spur run by the Southern Railroad. Uh, Doolin persuaded the railroad to run something out to the remount depot. I bring these things up not because that's the gist of what I want to talk about, but because you, you, you have to get this little bit of a background to think about how all of this money might have affected Alabama. We know that the money came in, and like I've said, we don't really know what happened. There's not been much scholarship on what happened. We can make a lot of surmises and suppositions, but we just don't know. All of this is open for research. Unlike Montgomery, Aniston did not have good access to the camp. Alabama Power Company, the city streetcar operator, refused to provide a track extension, so Major Doolin uh, had his soldiers pave Jacksonville Pike with bricks, hand labor, laying them one at a time. Aniston also did not have sufficient housing stock to accommodate the soldiers' families. This led first to overcrowding, and then to a building boom for houses. Now usually, and what happened throughout the rest of Alabama, was that rents skyrocketed. But that didn't happen in Anniston because the city appointed a liaison with the military whose job it was to keep those rents down. And uh, uh, the, the increase uh, was only modest. After the war, the Army retained Camp McClellan, converted it into Fort McClellan. 
Now, all of this activity increased Aniston's population by 39 percent between 1910 and 1920 when the um, censuses were taken. Besides training camps, the Great War benefited Alabama because of direct federal war spending. In northwest Alabama, Cyanamid Company built two plants to extract nitrates from the air, a process, oddly enough, made feasible in Germany in 1913. This air nitrate system was to replace the nitrates mined in Chile, which the American government was afraid would be stopped by German U-boat problems. And this nitrate was, of course, used in as the oxidizing agent in cordite and gunpowder and other explosives. Cyanamid's subsidiary, oddly enough called air nitrates, needed huge amounts of electricity to do this work. The federal government had uh, begun construction of Wilson Dam, shown here, it wasn't finished until much later, it became contentious when Henry Ford unsuccessfully pursued purchasing it in the mid-1920s. In fact, electricity for the nitrate plant came from Alabama Power's molten coal-fired plant about 24 miles south of uh, air nitrates. And thank you, Leah, for, for bringing that up. That's where I got that piece of information from, is out of your book on uh, Alabama Power. This is a, a map of the, a kind of a stylized map of the area. Area farmers welcomed the opportunity for an income stream outside of the unstable cotton market. Workers poured in in droves. The Great Migration was not only workers more white than black moving out of the south into northern industries. It was also the move of rural uh, laborers into cities in the south. Houston. Houston exploded uh, because of this, uh, for example. So did other places. Muscle Shoals did not exist as a town site of any consequence until uh, the war. Workers flooded the Tri-Cities area, in fact be making it become the Quad Cities, as well as this construction camp that turned into Muscle Shoals, Alabama. This huge influx of workers put a great strain on the infrastructure of the area that was not at all ready to accept them. It also put a great strain on the uh, social relationships of Northwest Alabama, Jim Crow. And cities and counties scrambled to arrange housing, improve streetcar transport, and provide sanitation, all three in, uh, uh, major uh, projects that were absolutely necessary. This was all made more difficult by Jim Crow. The intensity of racial segregation in this area was so great that there absolutely had to be separation of the races in housing. Uh, not as a, a moral imperative, obviously, but as a, uh, these people considered it to be uh, necessary. This was also compounded by a desire to separate single workers from those workers that brought their families. So ultimately you end up with four distinct housing areas in each of these towns to accommodate these workers. Obviously that didn't go so well. Uh, rents skyrocketed, war profiteering at the, at the retail level skyrocketed. By that I mean, you know, you and I making a deal, I'd jack up the price because I had you over a barrel. And because you had a stream of cash that you had never had before. And it, it's, it's kind of sort of meaningless. You're getting paid, were you getting paid much before? Not necessarily, not weekly, not monthly, and so you've got this cash that you don't know what to do with, you don't know how it really operates. It's not because you as a farmer are stupid or uneducated, but it's just such a, a, a drink, again, you're drinking from an economic fire hose. What do you do with all of this stuff? Um, the population of the Tri-Cities area grew over the decade from uh, rates of 16 percent uh, in Tuscumbia to 58 percent in the county seat of Florence. Let me wind up here talking about Mobile. Similar things occurred in Mobile. Great strains on the economy occurred in Mobile, not because they were poor, but because they suddenly became rich. They suffered from the fall in the cotton prices at the beginning of uh, the, the uh, World War I and from the July 4th, 1916 hurricane that wrecked the docks in downtown uh, Mobile. 
but federal contractors uh, arranged with five companies to build shipyards and produce merchant ships in the Upper Mobile Bay area except for Pinto Island. Only U.S. Steel with a contract for $20 million, one of them had a contract for $20 million, built a company town to house its workers. That's Chickasaw. Consequently, between 6,000 and 10,000 workers, many with their families, flooded into Mobile City and Mobile County. Now, how well did these uh, shipyards do? Many keels were laid, but no ships were built before the armistice. Remember, World War I is 19 months long. From the moment that we declare war to the moment the thing is over, 19 months. A few of these ships rolled off the line by 1921-22 and were immediately decommissioned and sold off to local shippers, the Waterman Company in particular, for pennies on the dollar that had been invested. U.S. Steel, operating as the Chickasaw Building Company, built steel ships in Chickasaw. Uh, ADSCO built steel ships out of Pinto Island. The Murren Company built four Ferris-class wooden ships. And Kelly Atkinson of Chicago, operating as the Mobile Shipbuilding Company, built so-called composite ships, sorry, composite ships of steel frames and wood covering. And then the F.T. Lay Company built what's called ferro-concrete ships, which is, a, you know, a concrete boat if you listen to, uh, 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 if you listen to, I can't, uh, I can't remember the singer's name, I'm sorry, um, a cement boat. Uh, anyway. Uh, the F.T. Lay Company built these, but only the U.S., uh, excuse me, the S.S. Selma uh, was launched. It became an oil tanker that cracked on a reef in Tampico in 1920, and it was moved over to Galveston and sunk and is now part of the jetty in Galveston uh, in 1922. So Mobile reaped prosperity into the 1920s, in large part because of all of this federal money that had come in uh, and there was so much attention uh, to local infrastructural projects that there had been a pent-up demand for, like the Cochrane Bridge, the Bankhead Tunnel, the State Docks, and the deepening of the channel that had actually been wrecked by the hurricane. They were actually working on deepening the channel when the hurricane came through in 1916. Anyway, these ideas had been percolating. Uh, percolating in Mobile for about a decade, and it was the federal money that came in and the attention of the city to finally moving ahead, getting the political will to move ahead, that allowed uh, these projects to move forward. So in conclusion, let me say that, again, this is not an area that has received anywhere near sufficient study at the state level or at the uh, even the local level. And it's going to be these local levels that allow those of us who deal with the state to be able to figure out what happened um, at the local level. We know that money, that people flowed out of the state for a variety of reasons. We know that money flowed into the state for a variety of reasons. And then suddenly, in 1920, you have all of these soldiers who had not died coming back into the state of Alabama. What do you do with those guys? Well, we happen to have a depression for them just to welcome them back home. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much.